<laughs> Would there be another maybe box sets in the works for the the later albums following these ones? Don't know. You know, there's contractual problems going on with some of that older stuff because Universal Music went in when when Napster happened. You know, after the the turn of the millennia, the whole music industry fell apart. And so Capitol Records, EMI Records, as we know it, uh, a lot of those major labels went under and they sold off, you know, the, their remaining product to, to other companies like Sony and uh, Universal Music are two of the biggest now that are there. I mean, their, their catalog is, is unbelievable of the things that they own now. And a lot of the, the later records that we did are, is under their umbrella. So being able to work with a company that's a behemoth like that is sometimes a little challenging, to say the least. What about uh, Steve Riley, who's played on, uh, I guess, Last Command, uh, Headless Children, and the live album? What are, I mean, now that he's passed, I mean, do you have any comments or about his contributions well, to those I wrote early a discs? Thing, I wrote a thing for him, you know, the day that it happened because that came as a, as a big shock to all of us because none of us saw that coming. And, you know, when something like that is, is so sudden, it, it catches you flat footed. There's no other way to describe it. And, you know, I lost my dad four years ago this month. Oh. And the one thing I, and in an, an 18 month period, I lost 11 people. Oh, geez. and not a one of them to COVID. You know, I was I mentioned Frankie just a second ago, and Bob. Yeah. You know, Frankie was cancer. You know, so none of them were COVID related. It was just you know one thing after another, and eleven people in that short a period of time. I I start thinking to myself, what's going on here? I mean, this is a wave that personally I had never seen before, and to be honest, to write obituaries over and over, or excuse me, eulogies, you know, over and over and over again, it gets, it's draining because one of the conclusions I came to, and I don't mean for this to sound insensitive, death sucks. There's no other way to describe it yeah. because I learned, and as a writer, I learned there's no words that we have, that we can say, that we can we can assemble together to make sense out of those losses. You know, it's <clears throat> it, it's it's like love. They say love is the most beautiful of all frustrations because there's there's not words to describe what it really is. Mm -hmm. Death is the same way. You know, there are no words that we can we can assemble or group together that really is going to change what it is. But what do you say to someone yeah. to comfort them? Yeah, there's nothing. You know, it, I, you know, as a writer, you know, I grasp for that. And like I said, you know, there was a number of those that I wrote. I got a friend of mine. He's pretty high up in the Pentagon. You know, he's part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He, w he was a submarine commander for many years. And he had to write a number of letters to parents for soldiers that died and i asked him i said uh I said how is it he goes i've written more than i can remember he says and i struggle with every one of them that i write yeah yeah I imagine you know so, so it's there's just there's no easy way to do it you know so like i said and, and in steve's case that that took us all we caught us all flat-footed you know we did not see that coming yeah well in a way this the, this box that is a testament to uh, steve right he plays on a lot of it yeah so Three. That, that's good. You know, news. and I wrote that in that in that eulogy that I wrote for him because, you know, one of the things that I said in there is that those songs that he played on Wild Child, Blind in Texas, I Don't Need No Doctor, those songs cemented our legacy. And he's a big part of that. The band appeared on the first album as a band, as Wasp, but as it slowly progressed to the second and third album, it's only you on the cover. Do you think that was a mistake and that created animosity within the people you were playing with? No, because that was a conscious decision because what happened and Tony Richards was 
forcibly removed from the band. And I, I kind of, you know, I don't really like to use those terms, but it was against all of our will. I mean, Tony had an alleged drug problem that EMI felt very strongly about. They, we signed the largest deal in history for any previously unsigned band. It was for two and a half million dollars. We won the lottery overnight, but they had such a huge investment in us. They were nervous and they did not feel comfortable. And they, they literally forced our hand to remove him and replace him. And that's where Steve Riley came in. And, but the problem with us was, and Chris and I fought it tooth and nail because we understood how valuable Tony was to us. Because when Tony was there, we were a real band, and we promoted ourselves as such. But when Tony was gone, we felt like we were mortally wounded, and we were no longer the band that we once were. So as a band, we made a decision to put me on the next two covers. But even that didn't feel right, and if you've noticed ever since, the band has never been on the cover from that time forward. You know, that all those were conscious decisions because it all stems back to hap- what happened with Tony. You know, so when Tony was gone, the next two records was us trying to find ourselves. We didn't feel like that worked either. So then we went to, you know, Headless was an animated cover, so so was The Idol. You know, and so from that time forward, like I said, you don't see any photos of anyone in the band ever again. What about uh, the PRMC? Do you think that we're living through another age of the PRMC? The uh, sort of uh, the canceling absolutely. of the canceling of freedom of speech? Sure. Absolutely. You know, when, when we first went through that, we didn't have enough experience to, to know what that was all about. But Frank Zappa did. You know, he had been through it in the early 60s. And, but we didn't know that, you know, and so Frank kind of ran interference for us, you know, to allow us to, to say and do the things that we thought were necessary. And uh, I got to know him a little bit, you know, because of that. And he, he was a really smart guy. And, um, you know, but looking at it compared uh, then compared to now, I don't see any difference because, you know, the whole idea. I think it's, of I think it's worse is, today. Isn't it worse today? <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's it, anytime, you know, the whole concept of freedom of speech is not designed to protect popular speech. It's designed to protect unpopular speech. So if you've got some mad dictator somewhere, I think he should be free to say anything he wants to say. You know, but at the same time, I should have the ability to disagree. And here's the difference I've got confidence and my fellow man, that if enough of them hear a load of crap coming out of somebody, they're going to have the intelligence to look at it, to see through it, and go, this guy's nuts. He needs to be done away with. I have confidence that, that people have enough common sense to to be able to, to look through things like that. But when you have other people trying to make those decisions for you, the age-old question then becomes, okay, they're playing umpire today, you know, and they're saying these people need to be canceled. Who gets canceled tomorrow, and yeah, who's the sure. umpire then? Yeah. You know, that's where it becomes dangerous. Nobody can sit up and make those decisions. So the concept of, of freedom of speech must be total freedom of speech. I don't care what you say. The concept of, of hate speech, that's all crap. Because who draws the line? I'm not saying I agree with it, but what I don't want to see happen is that what's considered hate speech today becomes something even worse tomorrow. And every time we do that, you know, it's been said that every day that Congress meets, we lose a little bit of our freedom every day. And it's the same with with limiting or restricting any kind of freedom of speech. You know, I'm against any of it. Yeah, we're in Canada, Blackie, and I mean, we're we're probably the leaders when it comes to that. When think- what goes on up there, and I shudder, you yeah, know, because that is that's absolute that's a police state when it starts to do that. 
So do you think that democracy has failed? Well, you know, I go back to Benjamin Franklin when the Continental Congress of the United States was trying to form this this government. And a woman, you know, there's a very famous quote that he made. A woman came up to him after they, they met, and she says, well, sir, what, what kind of government did you give us? And he says, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Mm-hmm. And that's where it becomes really interesting because, you know, Abe Lincoln, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, we are the government, or at least it was, it was when yeah. people participated in it. But when it gets to the point where it's run by money and bureaucracy, then you see quantum shifts start to happen where it is really only a phantom image of what it once was. And we are not far behind what you guys are experiencing right now here in the United States. Yeah. Sounds um, like a good, good subject for your next album. There, there's a number of subjects that I'm looking at right now that uh, are knocking on the door of what we're talking about. New album. All right, Alan, All right, Alan. mentioned it. Are you writing? Do you have anything recorded we're actually I, pre- we're pretty far into it right now you know mm-hmm. but when this thing happened on the tour and then you know i blew a gasket you know then all that got put on the back burner but uh we're pretty far into the writing process right mm-hmm. now so and you know we're excited about it but it's just it looks like we won't be able to get back to it until after the first of the year i mean a, a great a great tribute to you and the guys because i mean this the the, the latest albums are just as interesting and and uh that then you know going back 40 years i mean it seems like each album is uh just as strong as the last one it's it's hats off to you guys because that's that's hard to well, achieve you know you try with every record we do now you know i mean nobody makes money making records anymore so if you're going to make records now you're doing it because of your legacy and if you're going to do that, then you really have to make sure that it's as strong as it can be because you don't want to do anything and have, because it's always going to be measured against what you did to begin with. You know, all bands, they make their bones the first five years they're together. You know, the first five or six records they make, you know, the, their whole legacy, legacy is cemented there. It doesn't mean you can't make good records later on down the line. But everything's going to be constantly compared to that. In other words, think of whatever new record you do now as your opening act. You know, it's always going to be compared to that early stuff. And so for it to get, you know, an honest review or a fair shake, so to speak, that record, that new record has to maybe be even better than the original stuff was because people have had so many years to romance those older songs in their heads. Right, And when you go up against people that have been doing that for a long time, it's hard to erase, erase those memories. And you don't want to do that anyway, but you just want the new stuff to have a chance to compete. And the only way that new stuff can do that is they have to be solid records.